Hello and welcome to another episode of Making the Turn Golf Podcast with Double D and the Dooch. And man, are we pumped again because I don't know how we do it, but we get, keep getting people to agree to talk to us. But this week is pretty cool because in addition to having Double D going with us, who is in the middle of just an absolute personal landslide of cool things happening in his life, we had George Gankus himself take some time out of his very, very busy schedule to join us on the podcast today and talk all things about performance. Because if there's one thing I do know about GG, it's that, yes, he is very well known for really cool swing videos and really cool training aids, but he does a lot more than people see that's just not on Instagram. So I think it's great to have him on and have him share kind of where he's coming from in his spirit, because he has a very different entry way to the game. So, you know, didn't start playing golf till he was a senior in high school. One year later, breaks par and, and beats his old man. And, you know, that was kind of the genesis of it all and comes from a really cool background to where, you know, parents were both big into bodybuilding. So, George, I've spent a little bit of time with him. He's built pretty strong, but he also was a wrestler and just had this amazing athletic background. And it seems to have lent its way to golf. And then it almost seems like maybe coming from a background of teachers, he just kind of found his calling as a golf instructor and couldn't shake it. So. Without further ado, the man, the myth, the legend, Gigi himself, George Gankas. How the hell are you, man? I'm great. Thank you guys for having me. I'm excited. Um, let's get into it. Yeah, man. So uh, let's talk about that. Do I have it right? Was your dad like a, a gym coach, gym te teacher, or something like yeah. that? Yeah, PE teacher, gym coach. Um, and yeah, he was he was definitely, you know, a bodybuilder too. Not a professional, but he was, he was dad pretty was big. big. Yeah, he's big. <laughs> he was so, juice. He's yeah. Right. <laughs> so, like, that's kind of cool, right? So, I always think it's kind of interesting when you meet coaches who are really trying to maybe do something or say something that's very authentic to them, but maybe isn't perceived by everybody the same way in which it's given, right? So, I would say that you are kind of right now the maverick of the industry. Let's let's call it or the. Uh, the renaissance man who's trying to get back to you know motion and ball flight instead of worrying about what a golf swing looks like but like it just seems like you were kind of almost born to do this right like you come from this really athletic background there's some coaching involved there's some there's some leadership and some teaching and like all of a sudden you find yourself kind of doing more or less the same thing just a little more specialized well you know funny you say that i just thought about it. that's the first time i've thought about it that i was born to do this it's it I, I probably with my background of you know being an athlete and you know my mom is now a, a psychiatrist i mean being a sports psychology major i wouldn't say psychology i should say psychology because that's when i graduated that would be a lie if i said sports psychology major but i've read so much sports psychology stuff while I was, you know, playing golf. I mean, you were it's... playing college golf with Rick Sessinghouse. You ought to have the flow all figured out by now, my man. Come on. How crazy is that, that that I went to school with him and we competed on the same team is hilarious. I want to know what happened on that golf team because both you and Uncle Rick, as I like to refer to him, have the most amazing heads of hair. It's incredible. Like, that must be all hair, <laughs> like, golf team of all time. That's so funny because I never wear you know anything but a hat and everybody's like why don't you wear your why don't you wear your hair i'm like when you do know. you do though bro i give you credit because you must you, be the you, you take you must, it out like you must be the only golfer in existence who wears a hat and has great hair underneath because every other golfer takes their hat off but it's just a disaster it looks like they borrowed the, the top of the head off somebody else i don't i don't know i don't know it's i'm gonna tell you right now if if george tells you the barber shop he goes to it's somewhere in la and it is the trendiest spot ever because george he gets it going man it's not a midwest haircut i'll tell you that right now <laughs> well my wife is my hairstylist she's a hairstylist that's what she does so i got lucky to marry a lady that can you know fashion your hair i guess you'd call it but i don't do it often it's like a couple times a year but that's like <laughs> that's your thing man like i mean you know, it's it's such a weird world we live in, dude. And, and you know, we all say we hate Instagram and we hate having to do that stuff. But at the end of the day, we're all addicted to it, too. You know, so it's you know, we we all we have a very love hate relationship with it. And I think when you when you look at, at you as a commodity, you know, as George Gankus is the golf instructor product that people view you via social media. You know, you're out there in Gucci slides and Montclair parkas and like you're at a public range whacking ball. 
Like, I mean, it, it's got a weird, like, I shouldn't say weird, but it's got a very non-traditional vibe to it, man. And I applaud the hell out of you, dude, because I think that's the entryway that people are looking for. If you break down this massive, you know, amount of new golfers we have coming to the game, like 40, 50 percent of it's non-traditional coming into the game, dude. So I think you're on it, man. And I think that the way you teach golf is on it. And I think that the story, if you want to share maybe a little bit about it, about how kind of you and Matt got together, man, because like you had a very non-traditional way of kind of approaching Matt. Yeah, I, I mean, I appreciate that. First off, I, I, you know, my style and everything is probably just comfort. You know what I mean? And that Montclair jacket was from one of my really sweet, you know, lessons, the Townsend's Masa. And I don't have that much style that I could pull that off. So, <laughs> but you did anyway, which I appreciate. It was beautiful. <laughs> funny that I, I i've never known that anybody knew what that brand was because i didn't know what it was i put it on and everybody's like whoa those jackets are sick and i'm like, all right cool i guess i'll wear it but anyways yeah between you know matt and i and you know his you know swing that's obviously not what we'd call normal you know the first time i saw it i thought it was cool you know and, and i like a lot of the old styles you know i i, I like the cross the line i like the foot off i like you know, the full turn, you know, those are the things I like it when somebody rotates into a shop that shallows and it just moves by itself. And his stuff did it by itself. A lot of cool stuff was, was there when I saw it. And, you know, most probably not everyone, but most coaches probably would have took a different approach and said, you know, you got to get that on plane. But, you know, I love Freddie couple swing. I like, you know, I, I like Jim Furyk swings. I like a lot of swings that have character, you know, and, and that have a ball pattern that they could produce over and over has always been what's important to me. And I think that Matt was really good at, you know, solid contact when I met him. Ball patterns weren't where he wanted, but he could miss it a certain way. He just didn't like hooking it because he had a big slinger. He's way under, you know, people don't realize it, but he was anywhere from 10 to 15 into out, whether it was because of body lines or just under, you know, but he was in relation to where he was trying to aim his target. He was, you know, 10 to 15 into out, you know, and, you know, five to seven right with his face. And he was slinging it. So that'll do he, it. He wanted to stop hooking it, you know, when his body stopped from into out, the face shut down and he'd start on line and overhook hard. And he, he hated that shot. So basically, you know, we had some options, you know, work on getting that face to stay out right or work on rotation and getting the path more left. And it was, a simple call for both of us. And it was interesting when we started going more left, as you know, as a coach, you know, his face was out eight degrees, right? So now all of a sudden the ball is going straight to straight, right. And then cutting and he's all, what, you know, what the fuck? And I'm like, all right, well, either we need to learn to close the face a little bit and you have the weakest grip on the planet. So, you know, your path is just right to that open face and it works, but let's get this thing a little more shut. I said, let's strengthen your grip. He's like, I ain't doing it. And I'm like, all right, well, your grip's like this. It looks like a little kid grip. I said, you know, then we got to learn to flex it. And it's going to be hard to flex that from where your grip's at. Yeah. Let's get it. And he did right away where it was like, mm -mm, and it's still flex and, and hit it solid and, and could rotate with it. And I'm all, maybe you're the only guy on the planet who can do that, but you're doing it. So I just, you know, I thought it was cool what he was doing. And I didn't think that it was my place to change it especially you know after we made some changes he started like shooting some ridiculous numbers and you know in and honestly he doesn't hit any different now he still stripes it all day you know scoring is a different art and men mentality is a different art you know that's that's some things that he's he's getting trying to get better at now but if you watch him hit it you go i don't know how this guy ever shoots over par it's just the truth George. George, can I ask you just one comment you made there about studying some of the great old swings? And, you know, I understand that, that you know, you're an incredible student of the game. And particularly when you were starting out, you, you just went so deep in terms of looking at old tour swings and went all the way back. And, you know, looking at somebody like Bobby Jones, you know, who was playing the game nearly 100 years ago. Or, well, he was playing the game over 100 years ago. What what can you see in that swing that that completely traverses that century in between 
when he was at his prime and now? And what can people now take from that swing and, and apply it as a sort of relevant learning today? We're speaking of Bobby Jones, correct? We are speaking of the great Bobby Jones, yeah. I, I think that, one, if you look at his club would get crossed the line, his, his, his heel would come off the ground, which is super normal now. I mean, people are starting to get back towards that. Yeah. I think the phone is where he probably naturally went. So to, to, to not come off topic, but to move back into that, I see people that go, I want to be consistent. And it's a topic that I have with a lot of people. I go, what does that even mean? You know what I mean? I want to be consistent. And I said, well, go ahead and just swing one and they'll swing it and it'll slice. And they're like, it's not consistent. I said, hit another one, but don't think same slice. I said, you're pretty fucking consistent. You just don't like your consistency. So why, you know what I mean? It's, it's, yeah. it, that people can't be consistent. They see a ball fly right. And then they adjust with grip or feet or something. But if they just shut their brain off and hit their same shitty shot, they could play golf, you know, and, and they'd have a predictable pattern. It's when you try and change something that's making us not consistent. Is that the mentality or your mindset that's creating that? Or are you just already consistent? And you don't like it. Now, the point being is, when you look at Bobby Jones, I'm sure a lot of this stuff happened naturally. They didn't have videos. They had video, but they didn't really probably study it as much as we do now, not even close. So I think a lot of those things were natural for him to where he was fluid, probably didn't know much what his golf swing looked like, had some grip, posture stuff that he did over time. But when I look at it, what makes it still relative today is the length of it and the amount of turn is huge. And that's what we still are, you know, acquiring to do. I've got guys that I get. Honestly, you know, you could even ask John Pate, who's pretty much Steve Pate's brother. You know, he's 64, 65 almost. I probably got him more than 30 yards. And it was his shoulders were only 45 and he thought he couldn't turn. So I started to extend his legs, started to retract his trail shoulders, got his hands over his head. And that's what I feel like Bobby Jones did naturally. He had a big fluid swing. And, and with a bigger turn like that, and you start to use your body properly in the downswing, the shaft gets, you know, on your form and, and in a position that you can deliver over and over with a ball that's controllable. And I think that that's what he did really well. He rotated through the ball. There, there, there was a lot of great things he did that we still do. And I think that that's what people forget is when you see Matt Wolf there, when he comes down, he, he looks like everybody else at P6 when the shaft's parallel to the ground in the downswing. And even P5, it's it's nothing that's abnormal. You to jump I mean? in so there I too, think... George, on what you're saying there, I mean, you unpack some really good stuff there. And consistency, I think, is is kind of something that is very misleading, right? Because to go back to something you said earlier, you know, there's no doubt in my mind that when you met Matt and he was 14, 15 out and hanging a face at 7 to 8 to make the ball land on target, that he absolutely roasted it. Like, there's just absolutely no doubt in my mind. But the issue is, is that if he misses that face, even by just, let's say, you know, three, four degrees, that oh, ball is huh? going to start more or less dead at the target and then just turn over and it's roasted. And instead of chipping that miss, you got to get another ball out of the bag because it hits and goes because the spin rate's so much lower. So you're, we're, I think the hard thing with being a coach is that you know, especially with you that works with a lot of better athletes that can really move the golf ball is you watch them hit a great golf shot and they're like, see, take that coach. And you're like, yeah, that's great. But you do that 10 out of a hundred times, but 10 out of a hundred times, you also have this miss based out of that pattern. And that's what really kills your round. So if you look at how you deliver the club, you're super consistent. But to your point with that face to path changing all the time, all of a sudden, the consistency near the hole where the ball finishes is changing all the time. And that's what they say when they want consistency. All they're trying to say is they want to look like a PGA Tour player on Sunday more often. Yeah, absolutely. And the funny thing is, is that, you know, for Matt, in defense of, of when he was 13, when I first met him, it wasn't, you know, one or 10 out of 100 times or 10 out of 20. No. It was like. It was still pretty damn good. It was like, out of 20, I'd say three shots would be hooked. You know what I mean? And so when it, he didn't do that in a round, it was low. And when he did do it, you know, he was shooting 74, 75s. And so, and 
his defense or anybody's defense, it could have still been done. But like you say on Sunday when he's not feeling right, it, it could be a big deal. You know, so so those are things that are obvious that we changed o- o- like over, you know, a short period of time. But it was I think it was worth it for sure. But, yeah, I think the consistency there is there is there was such a big spectrum. And then you could also say, hey, listen, this guy's path is zero. It's perfect. But then his face is three degrees right. And now his ball is going six degrees right. And then if it's face three left, it's going six left. And th- those are both. I don't think ways. zeroing out the way to go either, just for the record. I, I, like, I wouldn't say that, like, zero is better than 13. I'm not trying to make that statement. No, no, I know you weren't, but that, that's, that's a conversation that, that people should have. You know what I mean? Sure. It, George, it, George, can I, can I ask you, and this is quite a binary question, which swing that you've seen have you loved the most? I mean, you, you talked about Matt having a, an action that immediately appealed to something inside you because it was so different, but so powerful and fast and, you know, all the things that we've discussed. But in your extensive study of the golf swing, if you had to pick one, which would it be and why? I think I think Sam Sneed would be a really good model for even present day just because a lot of the stuff was he was in motion. He brought it back pretty much right in a great spot up top. He had a long fluid swing, which is going to last a long time. Full turn. He rotated. He rotated really hard through the ball. There's just a lot of his, his hip depth, his hip his pelvis tilt and his left bend up top and his full turn created such good leg work in the downswing. I, I just think that there's a lot of good stuff that anyone can learn from Ben Hogan, whether it's even his setup. I like, cause he was a taller guy and he had a very balanced setup. He had a great, you know, everything there that I liked. I thought what I like is at P2 left arm parallel, the back line. And I think there's a lot of guys who go outside and then reroute later and get deeper. You look at Wolf who's way outside it. Freddie couples way outside there's a lot of good adam scott there's a lot of guys that aren't in that model but you know when i see guys that are in that and sam sneed's kind of like takeaway model and up top i i see them hit it pretty well but But i think that's because the body's driving the pivot right george like i don't think you're wrong there because if if you don't see that right like let's talk about like the club being way up right they're getting into radio deviation and basically, they're just trying to move the club head behind their body by retracting the right arm into the rib cage. 100%. And there's no pivot at all, right? Like, that's just literally trying to Strong. throw the club head over your shoulder. By yeah, the way, real quick, real quick. I have got, I, by the way, just so I'm not remiss, because I got it out, not that I had to look very hard. But, dude, <laughs> you're, you make us all better, man. Like, your training aids are amazing. I know if you're listening to this, you can't see what I'm holding up. I'm holding up a G box, right? Oh, wow. Part of the G series, which I absolutely love. We got the snappy wrist guy. Uh, we've got the boxes. We've got adult junior size. I mean, I think it's a really great training aid, dude. I love what they do. But what I wanted to talk about, I don't know what you're calling it officially, but the flappy bird or the flapper, dude, I think this thing might be maybe the best training aid to come out I, since I, the pro sender. Ooh, that's I, a big statement. The, the <laughs> bird. The fl- we we just didn't know what to call it, and still, we're, our launch is probably in the next three weeks. And they're like, "Okay, we got to call it like the G slot." But because one, what it does is is one when you get your trail shoulder to go external, it just snaps on your back, and it's it's really simple. And then when you do it, and and you can't reach it, let's just say I'm standing up, I turn, and I have forearm rotation. The thing will snap for your form. And the cool part is, is if you just turn to the top, it'd be like a pretty damn good position but that doesn't mean you have to use it like that but people are snapping it right at p2 some are snapping it in transition some are at three p3 but the guys who do it like i don't know it's 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 a good matchup for a g snap because when you do that and that the face opens with the flappy bird and your lead or trail wrist going into flexion or extension are, are a really good matchup for it. And it feels very pivot oriented once you get there, which is what George, we all are looking for. George, I want to sort of just rewind a little bit. I mean, you've had a, you know, you, you have an extraordinary career. You've now got all these incredible training aids that are part of the sort of George Gankis brand and helping golfers to get better. What was the sort of moment of epiphany that, because you 
but am I right in thinking he didn't really come from a golfing background? He took up the game late. What yeah. was? Do you remember that moment that you fell in love with golf? Um, yeah, I think I I fell in love with it when when I think it'd be probably really early, like nineteen twenty when I thought all sports were pretty easy. And then I realized that golf was really hard and, you know, I couldn't figure it out, but I thought if I studied the swing that I could perfect it and I was absolutely wrong. You know what I mean? I, I thought that I personally could figure out, you know, how to put something on repeat day in, day out. And no matter what I did, you know, the longest that I could go is probably six weeks without any adjustments to where things didn't get whacked. You know what I mean? Like I could have a constant ball pattern and say, I found this for life. And then something would go off. And of course, we don't know if it was a little ball position that got you back and you hit a couple blocks or hook. And then all of a sudden you start trying something different, whether it's with alignment or with your swing. And so that's probably my first infatuation is really early trying to figure out like if, you know, I could create something that I could do over and over and be like a machine, almost like a Mo Norman. And, and I couldn't, but I tried, you know what I mean? But I still, tr I still try to this day and I play a lot of good golf. I'm sure you guys do too, but I also play some shitty golf. And I think that it, no one's ever really figured it out. And I, I mean, the only thing that we've all proven George is nobody has all the answers, right? Because nobody's yeah. having a hundred, hundred percent success rate out there. Like nobody, like, I don't care how good you are. Uh, even the tour players that are really, really good, and then they lose their games. And a lot of times we lose our games because we start looking for the wrong shit instead of going back to what we were doing when we were hitting it good. Especially on tour. That I mean, they have all their, they have everything on tour that just shows when they were playing their best golf. So it's like, that, why change something from where it was the best they've ever played or hit it? Makes no sense to Look at what Victor Hovland's done. I mean, I think it's genius, right? Like, I mean, he's pretty much on the record that, hey, I kind of found my golf game and found really good golf in Oklahoma when I was going to school here. And instead of like making a pile of money and moving down to Florida and changing everything, including his environment, he was like, I'm going to stay here and keep getting better. And I mean, that's that's kind of more or less what he's done. Uh, he He has done it. And, you know, it's, for, for Victor, from the very start, when I first met him, when he was at Oklahoma, and I knew who he was before he was at Oklahoma State, and obviously I know him pretty well, he, he's been hitting the ball good a long time, and not to take away from Jeff Smith or Joseph Mayo, who's with him now, but that kid has never really struggled ball striking. I mean, I, I've watched him play a bunch of practice rounds, and I remember telling him the first time that I ever saw him miss a shot on the course was a... He had like 215 and it was a pin that was, I forgot where we were at. Whatever. It was a part three and he blocked one a little right. And I'm like, you know what? That's the first shot I've ever seen you miss on the golf course. He's all not, not a chance. I'm, all, I'm not kidding. I've never seen you miss a shot. Like when I say miss a shot, like a real quick hook or block, like something that you consider was fucking pretty bad for yourself. Right. It wasn't even, but it was the first one that was like almost a foul ball. And I was like, he's human. <laughs> yeah. George, how, you, know, you talked about ball striking there. And, and obviously, you know, a lot of the players you've worked with are, are supreme ball strikers. But can people get too hung up on ball striking? Because there are many different ways to play. There are many different ways to play the game. And there's many different ways to skin a cat. And there's many different ways to get the ball in the hole. I mean, I play, I've played in Britain. I've got an old fashioned sort of, you know, inverse C finish. I'm a bit of a picker, not a not a flusher. And you know, working I'm not a great it. golfer. But we're working on it. We're working on it with the with the douche. But do you think people can get too hung up on literally munching it every time? Uh, absolutely. I, I I think that I have a I mean I probably have I've got guys that are pros that are like, dude, that dude's good. What's he shoot? And I go, dude, he's been playing like a year and a half. He probably shoots 85. They're like, what the fuck? Like, I'm like, yeah, these guys can, can hit a ball where I didn't learn that first. I learned to play golf first. You know what I mean? I, I mean, I tried to hit it good first, but I learned to score immediately. You know, I, I was over on the wedge game working on 10 feet and in putting, you know, 
just making contact, moving the ball forward and creating a ball pattern that I could trust and just get it in the hole. And I think that a lot of these guys now start out to where they learn to hit the ball good, but they don't know how to get the ball in the hole yet because whether they have distance control, they miss both ways, they can't putt or chip, they don't work on it. You know, whatever it might be, I think that people learn way different. And I think that now let's get the swing perfect and I can score. And that's some bullshit as we know. So let's jump off there. Let's jump off there, my man, because like, I think what you're saying there is pure gold because, you know, I'm quote unquote, the force plate guy. And, you know, dude, people come to me all the time, fly into Detroit, you know, want to get on the force plates because they think I have the golden ticket because like there's this flawed way of thinking that amateurs have, right? Which is technique is the only way I've got to make more twos, threes, and fours to shoot lower scores instead of making less sevens, eights, and, you know, sixes. So, I mean, it's like, we got to kind of think about this differently. And I think if I had to guess, George, to kind of piggyback off my man, Double D, you know, I'm sure that the type of people that walk up for a golf lesson with you, you probably walk up half time, you're like, holy shit, like that guy hits it pretty good. You know what I mean? Like makes a good move at it, hits it nice, ball flight's good. Like you look at it on, you know, JC in the yellow briefcase, I see you still rocking uh, <laughs> in the flight scope, you know, the whole bit. And it's like, it all looks good, man. Like what, like, what are you going to do with that guy? But then you talk to him. And you're like, dude, what's your status like right now? Well, I don't know. I don't have any. Well, wh- why why don't you have any status, bro? What, like, I don't know, man. Like, I, I feel like I hit it pretty good. And it's like, okay, man, well, maybe we need to work on the other parts of the game instead of just hitting yeah. the ball. You know what I mean? Like, let's go. Well, I mean, it, that that is some stuff that I think as coaches, you know, for me now, I'm kind of a freak in the fact that I've always developed juniors and I've always developed players. And now I'm getting 20 handicappers or I'm getting guys that I see for one hour and they fly in for one or two hours. You know, like you said, they expect you to change their whole game. And some of them are already hitting it pretty good. And I'm like, why are we over here when we should be in different areas? Why are you not scoring? What are your stats saying? What, what exactly? Well, I don't take stats. I'm like, well, there's a problem right off the bat. I mean, and some people don't need to take stats. Like me, I used to tell my college coach, I don't need to take stats. I know where my weaknesses are. And, and, I, and I do know where my, and I'm sure you do. We all do. We all know that if we had something fixed, we'd feel a lot more secure on the golf course. You know, whether it's tight lies into the grain, fucking short pins, uh, tuck pins, whatever it might be that you don't feel comfortable with, we could go out there and put a lot of time into it and get better at it. And I think that when people come to me, a lot of times it's pure mechanics, mechanics, mechanics. And I get a lot of guys that are just starting and people think I just work with good players probably, but I work with so many ducks. And that's fun for me too, as I'm sure it is for you. I, sometimes it. tours are boring because you know they don't want to change not, they don't want to hear you like they just they want to like do what they already know how to do and already makes money with you know what i mean like and fucking you don't you yeah, i mean you can't blame them shit i don't I, George, exactly. George, just your point your, your point about people having you know knowing their their sort of weak spots do you think that's actually true because i think that most golfers have an a set internal narrative about their game but what statistics or what data, if, if they're diligent about collecting it, more often than not, it will show up something in their game that is com- runs completely counter to this narrative that they've built up. And the narrative is often built up around emotion and around scar tissue and around things like that. Well, actually, the truth is is often much simpler. No, you, you're correct on that. I would I would not argue your point at all. I think that... I think that a lot of people, when they actually do take really detailed stats, do find some surprises and where a lot of people go, I'm a terrible driver on this. And then you find out that they're actually gaining strokes on the field and you're like, you're not that bad. You know, so, so you're correct yeah. on that. Some people, you know, some people kid themselves into saying they're great putters and that doesn't hurt you. But realistically, we look at your stats and from like eight feet in, you're not that good. Let's work on that. You know what I mean? So, yeah, I agree with you there, too. You know, if, if you we had Sean Foley on, he was our last guest. Um, love Sean. He's a good dude. But I love him too. He's great. yeah. So we were uh, we were talking and there's a story that just I was reminded of, you know, Justin Rose and Sean were still working together at the time. And Justin was in the short game area, I guess, giving it to Sean pretty good about how he was the worst chipper in the world. And uh, Sean went over and pulled the strokes gained and like comes back over and shows Justin he's actually the best in the world at it. And uh, you know what I mean? Like, 
just totally blew Justin's mind and really changed his outlook on it. But, you know, something that I read, I can't remember if it was the GQ article you did or one of the other amazing pieces that you're always featured in. But, you know, one of the guys took a lesson and was very apprehensive about working with you because they, you know, they're not a great player, self-admittedly. And you were like, hey, man, like, I'm a doctor. Like, I'm not going to just, like, walk up to you and tell you suck. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to just tell you're dying of cancer. I'm going to try to give you some possible solutions and, like, talk you off the edge. But, like, that's what you're saying, right? There's people that, like Justin Rose, who need that data to feel good about what they're doing. But then there's other guys who like you in college, like, Hey man, like I'm out here doing my thing. And like, I got enough going on to where keeping stats is only going to get further in my way. And like, you got to know the difference, right? Yeah. hundred percent. And and maybe my philosophy was wrong. I can't say it was right. I was not a world beater, but I, I would say that, you know, day in, day out, you know, shit, you hit fucking you block five drives in the fucking woods you know damn well you're not a great driver you know what i mean it's not that hard to feel you know what i mean <laughs> so you know i've always known where my weaknesses were in my opinion and and now i would say i know exactly where my weaknesses are down to have time to work on them and are they that important to me you know depends on how, how much golf i want to play you know what i mean right <laughs> I, mean, I mean it's I different around it's it's there's as long as I'm not losing balls and as long as you know I'm not hitting in the hazard and I'm not three putting I can shoot in a par you know what I mean and, and that's probably the key, the biggest key to my game for playing everything else is is decent to where if I keep in play I'm I am not probably going to shoot much over par George, I wanted to ask you just to get into the jumping around a bit, and I apologize for that. But Padre oh. Harrington is a character character I've come across quite a quite a few times in my career. When I was at the depths of my worst uh, chipping problems, Padre said that he could cure me, and then singularly didn't cure me in front of a crowd of people at Royal Liverpool, which was uh, one of the most humiliating moments I've ever had in golf, and I'll, I will never forget that. But Padre is an incredible guy; has an incredible mind. He is. In a mate has an amazingly inquiring mind. He's always looking for an edge. As a coach, you know, and as somebody who not only a coach, but many people have described as a mentor, what is the challenge of working or what's the joy of working with somebody who is so inquiring and is so questioning and has a mind that's so alert and agile? Well, one, I did obviously work with Podrick for a couple of years or a year and a half, whatever it was. And it was probably some of the most enjoyable times of my life. I mean, honestly, my wife loves him. I love him. You know, Ronan is caddy. I love him. I think that they're 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 a great duo. And I think that he's very, you know, information seeking at all times. And I thought it was some of the most fun times that I had teaching. So when I get a when I get a coach that I don't even know as a coach, I go, You ask a lot of good questions. What do you do? And they're like, Well, I I teach out of, you know, wherever they're teaching. And I'm like, Oh, that's probably what I enjoy most is when people are questioning what I'm teaching, not in a way that they're questioning, you know, philosophies. It's questioning what they've learned in the past and why would I want to teach this over that? That's stuff that's fun for me. I don't even mind debates. I like that too. That's fun. So when somebody comes and they really want to learn certain things and they've had these preconceived notions of what should happen. And then they hear this and they go, why? I love talking about stuff like that. It's not that, hey, you have to do this or you have to do this. That That's really not me. It's just when someone starts talking shit, I enjoy that too. I enjoy a lot of different aspects of, of, of golf conversation. You know what I mean? I, I think the thing there, though, that, that really comes through with you, I've spent time with you. We had a great talk at, uh, at Augusta. You know, I got to spend some time. You know, we were out watching Matt and uh, James Pyatt um at augusta national and we spent a, a good a, amount of that afternoon just talking but you know this this idea that when when you really are trying to be out outright and and forthright with your information man you know it, it's like i i don't disagree with you like i don't mind when people ask me why as a matter of fact i prefer it like me i too. hate golf lessons where i just feel like i just hammer the person and it's just like i'm the only one talking because there's no learning going on. I mean, we both know that they're just, you know, kind of all or, or whatever happens to them. And, you know, you really got to figure out a way to communicate with that person. But I think the thing that's really challenging is getting, 
people in our industry to maybe not look so far backwards. And I'm not saying that we can't learn a lot from these great swings, because of course we can. And I think that there's some amazing things that we can learn. But at the same time, the task that they were being challenged with was a completely different task than that of what we have today with a completely different golf ball. Therefore, the modeling has to change because the golf ball does something completely different. And it's like, I think guys like you are trying to move the needle forward and advance the topic, just as I'm trying to do with what we do. Um, But at the same time, it's like, there's also a lot of people, man, they don't want to hear it. And, you know, it's it's kind of a weird industry and we're at a weird point in our our industry because I really think there's a changing of the guard afoot. And I don't know that the the guys that are being changed out really want to be changed out. <laughs> no, I, I think that you're you're absolutely correct in that. And I don't think I think you're way younger than me, but like I think that the next generation of kids are so smart. I do. I believe that they're very how old are you? I'm thirty eight. Yeah, well, you'd be right around the area that I'd say is going to take over between probably like 27 and 38. Those those are the guys that are going to take over the teaching area, uh, the teaching of, you know, our next generation. And I think that it's important because I think so many of these, these what I'd call kids have studied under so many people. They're all like little comos, you know, trying to sponge from everybody. And I think that's that's the thing that, is very important for me. I didn't sponge from really anybody. I kind of cheated by sponging off players. Like I just watched players, watch players, watch what they did, wanted to learn myself, went out and played, experimented with myself and not saying myself, I, I probably could have accelerated my, my, my information and, and how I did things a lot quicker. If I would have opened up to other people and asked for like stuff. And I, and I kind of wish I did, but I never did. I'd just be like, all right, well, I'll try this or I'll try this or I'll try this. And sometimes some of the things work, but they they have to be matched up with something else. You know what I mean? So, you know, if I'm going to be a guy who's really throwy here, I better have my pivot moving forward for like a wedge. But if you don't match that up, this shit doesn't work. And now all of a sudden you go, this doesn't work. Well, of course it doesn't because you ain't doing it right. You ain't matching it with something else. So someone said, do something in my golf swing. I better match it up. If I feel like I should move pressure off 70, 30 to P3, I better learn to recenter. How do I recenter? I could recenter over here. I could recenter over here. I can recenter the proper way. I mean, there's different ways to get your scale to read 50, 50, you know what I mean? And there's different ways to get pressure 90% on the left or 90% on the right. They all have different looks. So that's another thing that with, with force plates that I've looked over time, I'm like, bro, I could get 90% of my pressure on my right heel like this without any tilts, or I could get it on with the prop. You know what I mean? So, so looking at data is not always is perfect. So those are the things I think the next generation is going to be so far ahead. Well, you're absolutely of- right though. You, you said something that I thought was really key because I'm one of the guys that has definitely went and sponged. And uh, you know, the thing that's been really good for me is that, I got kind of fortunate to where I didn't really know anything at all. You know, I was just a young coach that had played a lot of golf and had figured some stuff out for myself and was like, just, you know, trying to figure it out. So what was nice though, is like, I kind of had to learn the body through force plates first. Like that was kind of how I learned it. And then the cool thing was, is then going back and learning about how the club moves and becoming a track man master. I think that's, what's really been cool is like, understanding how the body and the club and then what we want the ball to do from a ballistics term i mean being able to kind of put the pieces together man i mean it just makes it so much easier to teach golf instead of being stuck with hey the only thing i can do is wrist angles because that's all i've ever learned i i agree or you know trying to move your path left by just using your arms over the top or or sliding because that's the only way to get it into out or keeping your chest closed forever because you think a draw can't be hit with a uh, chest that's open is absolutely still incredible to me to me is is the, the the amount of bullshit i hear over years so i learned it completely opposite i learned what the body looks like to create the pressure and so when i would talk to like scotty scotty lynn he'd go how do you know pressure is going to be there I, I can just see it I'm not trying to be cool he's all you're fucking right and i'm like i'm not i'm not trying to be right i just have seen golf swings for so long and when we first got on the force plates, it's it's not that I didn't need one. It's almost like Butch saying, I know, you know, I see what a ball does. I can hear sound. He's done it for so long. He has the right to say that. You know what I mean? 
I, I can I could tell you where a path and face is and you could go, well, you don't know what his angle of attack is. I'll tell you what his fucking angle of attack is pretty close to. You know what I mean? Which is gonna move the ball right or left, depending on how much up or down you hit. And I think that I I think that that's the way I learned first. I learned by seeing motion and getting people to develop certain things to create the motion I wanted. And then I was like, all right, this, this tilt and this extension is creating more pressure on the hill. Oh, this shoulder going lower, is, is that come from my shoulder or is that coming from hip flexion? Or is it just when I separated, my shoulder happened to be in the way of that hip flexion? You know what I mean? So there's, is that what's putting more pressure on there? Or is it just my shoulder going low as I open up? So things like that are cool where, where I, I, I probably learned backwards of what you did because I had a case study after a case study of, of players and I had a chance to fail. I'm like, all right, this guy's, if he comes back, I'll get him better next time. You know what I mean? I've been doing it for so long that that's probably where I learned different than the kids today. They've already got a lot of good info where I had, I had to probably do it a lot more on the mat. I had to fail a lot more. George, talking of kids today, I can sort of hear some some background noise there. You became you became a father relatively recently, so belated congratulations for that. What have you learned about yourself since becoming a father? Shit, that I'm not that important. <laughs> That's what I found. I'm only important to make sure that he's doing well and my family's doing well. And I think that that drives me in certain ways, but it's, you know, it's it's a different joy. You know, it's it's really... You have to come up with some different energy than you thought too. You know, being as old as I am at 52, I feel like I didn't think it was going to be as fun as it is. And at first, the first couple months weren't fun. If you, if you're going to be a new father, they're not that fun in my opinion. But now when he's smiling at me, you know, for the last few months when I come in and wants to hang, like wants to be held by me, it's, it's melts your heart. That's beautiful, man. I mean, look at that. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I think that that kind of really rings true, right? Like you come from this long line of people who were educators and had a background in physical fitness. And then, you know, I think the thing that kind of all coaches share is the fact that we all more or less want to help others, right? Like I think that, you know, probably having a kid is really a, a great thing to happen for a coach because it really teaches you kind of how to fail again and kind of how, how to have that humility again, right? I, absolutely. I find that some of the things that I worried about, you know, before are not important. And I think some of the things that affected me aren't that important. I think it just puts you a lot of things in perspective is, is where I think it, it put me personally, which I think I needed, you know, and I think that people are, why aren't you out on tour? Like you used to be, are you retiring? Are you done? Or I'm like, I kind of just enjoy chilling, like still working my ass off. Can I ask but you a question happy. about that? Huh? Can I ask you a question about that? As somebody who's so, also uh, been out there a little more in the past than he has been recently, um, is it everything you thought it would be, like, as a coach? Like, you know what I mean? Like, for us, you know, to... go ahead. Okay, so for, for one, I think that everyone needs it if they're a coach at first because they need... Validation. They need validation, they need people to know that you can coach tour players. And I, I personally, now that I've done it, is it everything I thought it would be? Absolutely not. A absolutely not. And don't get me wrong. If, you know, I got DJ knocking at my door, I got Bryson and I got, you know, I would go out there because they, they'd be willing to pay the price that I wanted to go out if they were looking for something like that. But when I was there, I was losing money. And so losing money and traveling away from my family did not make sense. And I did it for, I don't know, since 2014, 15, whatever it was, to like 2022, 20, probably 22. And then I stopped doing it as much. And people were like, what, why, why are you not? I'm like, because I make so much more money here, one. And it's a lot easier. It's a lot less stressful than, you know, the having players play good or bad and the ups and downs of that and me developing juniors. I just did it in another podcast is really, I think what my true love is. I enjoy because I can make a big difference. I think we all can as coaches where with the tour player, you can make a big difference, but not as, you know, impactfully as if that's a word as you know, you can with the junior. Impactfully. I agree. I, agree. You know I mean, I, mean? I, I love talking to the kids about, 
you know, what it takes to play great, you know, like they want to play great in states or whatever the case may be. Right. And it's like, okay, well, let's talk about the six months leading up to that. And they're like, what? And it's like, yeah, like we got to practice being great because you don't just show up and become great. You show up and you're already great and you just do great things. Well, you, you, that's what you do. You Absolutely. coach the, if I'm right in thinking, George, you coach the six year old world champion. I mean, I would love to meet that kid, a that's six a- year old world champion, but how, how good was he? Is he? Um, I would just love to see that kid play golf. I'll tell you what, the first time that I met him, he was four and a half and <laughs> Varner, Harold Varner, his dad is, is, I believe his manager and agent, one of the nicest guys on the planet. He, he brought, he brought him over to see me cause they live in Santa Barbara and I'm an hour away from Santa Barbara and Westlake. And they brought him out the first time and I'm all, damn, this kid's pretty good for like four years old. I was tripping. I was like, and he was such a sweet kid and he just hit it off the tee and just like pop it, pop it, little lefty. And, you know, he'll bring him out to me once every couple months. And, and so I would say I'm influential on his golf swing for sure, but not influential as much as his dad has to be and the people around him practicing because he's doing a lot of good practice a lot of like i'll tell him what to do like putting drills and putting games and he'll go get them done you know what i mean they they get it done that's that's the coolest thing about teaching a junior is the ones that are good have good parents that can really like i don't want to say force them to do it because he wants to do it he wants to play golf but his dad they make it available they make it doable for the kids i think right like there's a difference, right? Like I have a waiting area here uh, at my, my at my indoor facility. And, you know, like I have parents that come and they just sit in the waiting area and wait for the lesson to be done. And then I have parents who like, you know, 10, 15 minutes towards the end of the lesson, like they come over, they kind of want to know like what the plan is, what you work on. Cause like, I don't like hovering, right? Like I don't, I don't put up with that. But at the same time, like they want to come over, get some notes. What's the drills? We film a couple of things. And like send them on their way. But the secret to successful junior golfers is always the same thing. They are committed to practice and they are committed to getting better every day of the week, not just the day of the tournament. I'll tell you what, I, it's, I mean, then I've got Masa and the Townsend kids who rip people like they're, they're so good. And they started it, you know, they started with me at seven. One of them started with four, one of them started at three and they're just pretty dominant. But it has a lot to do with the parents. It really does, for in my opinion, of the kids that I've seen. Because either I have a good story about a kid that the mom was just, you know, some parents are infatuated with certain looks. Like, I want to swing right here. And you're like, listen, there's swings over here. I want to swing right there. I'm all fine. I get it there. Just relax. And sometimes you have to, like, as you know, be like, listen, stop it. That This, this is not where you really want your kid to be, okay? But the fact is, is she had a pretty good point, which to me is not that important. And it probably should be looking at Rory with the best balance on the way through on the planet. And I always hit a drive and smoke it and I pick up and I'm almost falling over and I go get my tea and I just fall. It's not, it, when I'm, when I'm because eating. you're wearing Crocs, George. That, that's yeah. why. <laughs> Absolutely. Probably because I'm wearing Crocs. But irons, I'm not falling over on. But driver, I'm probably swinging out of my ass 99.9% of the time. And the fact is, is, is the mom comes up and goes, I'm fucking hate their finish. And those are exact words, not just, I hate their finish. I fucking hate their finish. I'm like, all right, well, let's get them over to the mirror and I'll get it right through the eyeballs and I'll just finish it right here. So I'm doing it up on the toe and she goes, I go, she goes, how many should you do a day? And I'm like, you think they're going to do it a day? She said, I'm going to make them. I'm like, how many a day? I said, give them 20. She said, if it was your kid, how many would you do? I said, 100. And she goes, all right. Swear to God, the next week, they come every Friday. These kids are all, boom, sticking their finish. I'm like, what, what the fuck? I'm like. 100 a day, baby. Probably 200 a day, honestly. But I swear to God, that's that was what she told me. I'm like, wow, that's a good lesson for a lot of the other actual parents out there. If they want to bust them up, that's what they do. My favorite you know I mean? thing I ever heard about uh, Tiger Woods, uh, the, my favorite story is, and I got this from the Arizona State uh, men's golf team, but they went out to Stanford's tournament, the uh, one of the years Tiger was there, and they said they pulled up in the van and they said it was just like monsoon raining in Stanford. Like it was just terrible, right, in Palo Alto. And uh, 
they said they pull in and like the players are all upset because they don't want to get out of the van because it's pouring. They said there's one guy out there just riping balls in the middle of this monsoon. No rain gear, no hat, no nothing. Tiger Woods out there just like it wasn't raining at all, just in his own little world, uh, striping balls. Uh, yeah, there's a difference. There's definitely a difference between, you know, these guys that are good and not. It's usually the mentality that starts it all. It really does. And you got to build it, right? It's not, I mean, you have a, a degree in this, right? So it, it's not one of those things to where I think a lot of people would just think that there's a zone you can click into, but. If you're not putting in the work developing those skills, like you're not going to be able to call on them when you need them. Absolutely not. And I think that, I mean, honestly, when we talk about like a tiger or somebody else like that, I think that every kid that you can tell when they're going to be good, just like right away, just from their swagger, every little kid is fucking cocky. Every kid that's cocky in your neighborhood, there's one or two of them every year and they always end up the best. You see them at seven to nine to eleven. Those are that's when you start seeing their they walk different. They think they're badass around their friends, and they're usually the ones that that come up. It's all you probably have it in your area too. Yeah, that's what we breed. My uh, Wi-Fi password for the facility used to be no feeder fish. What is it? Yeah, no, my no feeder fish, only shark. Uh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, man. That's I mean. It's, I mean, I, I've, a couple of things you've said just remind me so much of Kevin Kirk. Uh, he's a great friend of mine. And, you know, Kevin really talks a lot about being Kaizen and, and always trying to find a, a better way and always trying to learn. But he also talks a great deal about warrior culture. And, you know, I mean, that's, that's kind of what you're talking about, right? That swagger and, you know, developing that in young people, man, because, you know, it's hard for a guy that's 52, right? Like, just wait till another 10 years goes by, man. And now you're 62. And now you got a 10 year old kid that's coming home telling you about things on some device you've never heard of on some platform you don't know exist. And like, they're calling them things you didn't even know were bad things yet. You know what I mean? Like, it's going to be wild, man. Like, how are you going to, you know, relate to that person? And how are you going to teach them to be confident? Because the world is a scary place, man, as you know, and I'm sure you're more aware of now as a, as a new father, but you know, you got to teach them how to be a warrior, man. And you got to teach them how to have that swagger. And that's what I love about your videos on social media is it's always big energy, man. Like, and I applaud you because as a coach that works and like, like you, man, I love the public. Like that's where, that's my calling card, man. I'm a public kid at heart. So, uh, you know, having the energy for that guy that, you know, isn't so good, like that's tough, man. And I applaud you because it's not easy to do. I, I appreciate that. I learned that pretty pretty young as far as that you know even if somebody wasn't very good and I didn't do this because of this but I just always felt like it was a challenge to help everyone you know what I mean just because you suck imagine if you get this guy good and he really does suck you know you're gonna get a bunch of his friends who suck too and you're like fuck that's a lot of energy I'm gonna be dealing with now you know what I mean yeah. but it ha you know you fix and when we say fix you they're not as bad. All of a sudden, they're like, wow, this guy's got good over the year. Maybe his coach is helping him out for real. You know what I mean? But a lot of it, as we know, comes into the player, how much they want it, too. And if, if they want it, I feel like, you know, a good coach can probably pretty much change any, any, any bad stuff that anyone's had. I do. I believe that. We have the power to, to make impactful changes on every player that doesn't believe they can be fixed. If they also put in the energy, my favorite I mean, lesson, man, I love the airport lesson with the guy that just, you know, like I travel a lot with my force plates, like that's part of my shtick, you know, lugging those things around all 250 pounds of them, like, like the good, good Lord's work I'm doing. But like somebody sees me because the track man doesn't fit in the bag. So like, I always got to carry the track man separate, which is just click at an airport. There's always some like poor, like golfer guy that finds me like, right as I've taken a first bite of something to eat. And he's like telling me how he's just completely hopeless and all that. And you know what, man? I swear to God, I do. I stand up and I help that guy right there in the airport. And dude, I can't tell you how many text messages I've got or like emails I've gotten from people because my car doesn't have my cell phone anymore. But like, you know, you get an email and they're like, dude, that helps so much. And you're like, dude, that's what it's about. We're just trying to help people play better golf at the end of the day. That's, that makes you feel good. That's that's very, very that is cool. Almost. I mean, there's been so many airport lessons or elevator lessons or some shit that's gone down no matter where 
or people just go, I'm getting Gucci. They're just the stupidest shit ever. But it's it's kind of funny that I get I get all kinds of weird stuff too, and it's fun. It, it's it's probably what it's about for us. I imagine that you uh, feel very similar to Howard Stern walking down the street and just getting the most random, absurd things yelled at you ever. Well, you know what? For a while there, probably in 2014 to 2019, it was pretty nutty. Things have chilled out, thank God, from from there. But you know, I still go on tour, and it's it's kind of funny. It is. It's different. They, they, you realize how many golf people there are compared to, I, you know, when I first, I started teaching this kid, what's his name? Uh, D.O.D. King, you know, Car Carter, you know, D.O.D. King. I've heard of him. Yeah. 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 He's hilarious. Now, no matter what, what happens, there'd be kids on the mat. No way. And he's on the mat. Like th those were funny days when that shit would happen to me. And I don't, I, I don't miss it at all. It's kind of, kind of nice to be under the radar. Like I've always been, it's much better. He, and, and he's that Carter kid, the, the DOD King, he's a good dude. And he's funny. He can play golf too. I don't know if you've ever seen him. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, he's hilarious. He can, he can he's rip hilarious. it off the deck. Kind of, yeah. Talk shit, but he, he can actually, he can play. He's not bad. He's well, not you're bad definitely, you're definitely one of the more recognizable guys out there that people spot, because I mean, it's like, at Augusta, it, at Augusta, it's hilarious, right? Because nobody has their cell phone, so nobody knows anybody anymore because they can't just look everybody up on social media. So it's like the only two people you recognize on the range is like you and Sean Foley. And maybe not Sean as much now with his new deal, uh, but like... I can never not see Sean because Shawnee's always there with his hair fucking slicked back and perfect every time. Absolutely, man. So... I, w I just want to thank you, man. I really appreciate you coming on. We could go for another yeah, couple hours you, for sure. Um, I know, I know Double right. D enjoyed it. Um, I, yeah, it's brilliant. So thanks so much, George. Really, really enjoyed speaking to you. Love your work. Um, next time, in, next time I'm in your neck of the woods, I'm going to come and get on the mat with you. Well, congrats on what you're doing with the, the stats and, and the scorekeeping. I hope it all goes good. Give me, I'm going to, when I get off the phone, I'm going to look it up. What is it? One more time. It's called Clipped. C L I P P D. Look it up, George. Oh, C L I P P D, as in you dog. Got it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's Clipped. the one. Cool. And they're taking over NCA scoring, where Golf Stat also does scoring, but they're they're not in competition. They're not they're doing we, we, scoring. They're doing actual data capture. So they're doing the statistical analysis and all that fun uh, stuff for all the players. So no scoring. No, no, we'll we'll be doing the no, no, we will be doing the scoring, but we also work with um over a hundred college programs, George, from like Wake Forest women to Georgia Tech men. Um, so we provide data analysis and data insights for them. So yeah, let me let's definitely connect. I'd love to show you show you it next more. time we're together. I'll walk you through it. You'll love it. Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, guys. Well, thank Please. you guys for having me. I had a great time. Well, we'll thanks so much. I really appreciate it, man, for, for coming on. As always, I want to make sure I give you a plug because I hope tomorrow you send me one because I definitely want to get the flappy bird. But if you're interested at all in any of these amazing training aids, please go awesome. and visit Ganka Sports. That's the place to be to get all these great training aids. And if you haven't, which I don't know how because he has over 300,000 followers, please make sure to give him a follow at George Jankis Golf on Instagram and across all social media platforms. And as he said, if you're in California and the Westlake area, make sure to stop by because he is still doing the Lord's work and helping public Joe everywhere. So once again, thanks for listening. Make sure to download this podcast. And until next time, keep grinding.